It is my great pleasure to introduce to you this evening Sarah Bloom Raskin. Sarah is a Rubinstein Fellow at Duke University since 2018, focusing on economic resilience and advocating for tackling climate change. Prior to this, she was the Deputy Secretary of the US Department of the Treasury. And previously, she was a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors from 2010 through 2014. She brought a perspective that incorporated consumer protection as an aspect of financial stability. And she recently called for stress testing for the Fed, and more generally, a better integration of climate-related risks in the financial systems. And so when the Climate Crisis Committee at the US Senate during the Trump administration looked for people to testify on the importance of climate change, she was naturally there. Sarah, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Frederick, for that kind introduction. And it is a pleasure to be joining the Green Swan Conference today. In the midst of one of the largest economic transformations in world history, the Green Swan Conference is providing a place for us to virtually assemble, to assess progress, and chart the course ahead. I'm reminded of something said by Archimedes, the Greek mathematician. Give me a place to stand and I shall move the earth. Here we are in that place. Many of us have now experienced two economic crises in but one lifetime. We have witnessed and managed the effects of the global financial crisis of 2007. And we have witnessed and managed the effects of the global pandemic of 2020. In fewer than 20 years, there have now been two global crashes, albeit different, but nonetheless, two more significant economic calamities than some people have experienced in a lifetime. Indeed, in both crises, the world's economies were overtaken by what has been understood to be a tail risk, a set of events believed to be low probability, but high destruction. This last crisis, in particular, the pandemic and its ensuing pain and suffering, underscored the fact that there are risks that had not been sufficiently prepared for. Indeed, one can see the United States' inability to prepare for climate change, not unlike its inability to prepare for a hidden virus that created a public health emergency with profound effects on the economy, jobs, indeed, the entire common good. If we take nothing else from the global financial crisis and from the continuing effects of the pandemic, it should be that our collective well-being is at risk of serious disruption from climate change. This threat, which is both looming larger and larger every day and with us right now, presents central banks and other financial, prudential, and market regulators with the imperative to act in a precautionary manner. Embedding a precautionary imperative into the work of central banks and other financial market and prudential regulators will require a two-pronged approach. First, preparing the financial system to weather climate change effects that can't be eliminated by markets. And two, incentivizing a rapid, orderly and just transition away from high emission finance and investments. But let's back up for a minute and ask ourselves whether and why any approach, let alone a two-pronged one, is even necessary. After all, in the United States, at least, we are seeing the emergence of a markets first, private sector heavy approach. Financial regulation is an afterthought, a nice to have, but not a must have. The going in assumption is that markets will fix the climate and that the use of financial regulation may or may not come later. In other words, a precautionary approach to the use of financial regulatory tools is not assumed. So let's ask, is there a justification for a tilting 
towards a precautionary approach? And then what might it look like for the US financial regulatory agencies to embed a precautionary approach into their work? Let's start with the justification for a tilt in the approach of financial regulation. Historically speaking, early interventions by the US financial regulatory agencies ahead of the full-blown manifestations of risk are few and far between. Typically, the US financial regulatory agencies are slow to bring their tools to the workbench. Nearly all significant regulatory reforms have occurred after the risk has overflowed, after the fact of the crisis or catastrophe. Prompt corrective action was enacted after the savings and loan crisis. Derivatives reform came after the financial crisis. The typical political view of the US has been, if it's not broken, don't fix it. And certainly don't think of it as broken unless it's a really big splintered mess with hundreds of pieces everywhere and a gigantic disaster. This wait and see philosophy makes little sense in the context of a risk that if unabated continues to introduce unplanned for and exceedingly high costs to the economy and society. Unquestionably, unabated climate change is introducing unplanned for and exceedingly high costs. These costs range from the early and easily quantifiable short-term ones to the harder to quantify, but altogether real medium-term and long-term ones. The obvious short-term costs are the costs to clear and repair or rebuild the destruction from wildfires, hurricanes, and property that have been damaged by sea level rise. The less obvious costs, but no less real ones, are the costs that are associated with the effects of more drought and more extreme heat on agriculture and on labor productivity. Even less obvious and less noted where little, if any, quantification yet exists and the costs associated are the costs associated with strains on public and private infrastructure, the costs associated with, um, it, with increased levels of illness and disease, the costs associated with more frequent migration patterns, the costs associated with disputes, some of which will be violent over scarce resources, and the costs associated with political instability. Can markets alone take care of these costs from climate change while government stays on the sidelines? Probably not. Consider it this way with a navigational metaphor. Now, I'm no sailor, but I read an account of some sailors that bring a supreme maritime challenge to mind. Up off the coast of British Columbia, there are two powerful sets of currents that are very close to each other and nearly intersect. One powerful set of currents is called the Strait of Georgia, and the other set of currents that is very close and also very powerful is the Queen Charlotte Strait. Although the straits produce vortexes that will spin you under, there lies between the two of them a single narrow passage. Traversing the straits while not becoming subject to the vortexes is exceedingly challenging because of the instability and narrowness of this single passage that exists between them. Any wrong move can throw your boat into one or the other powerful and dangerous currents and vortexes. The only way to maneuver through this passage between the two straits is to have instruments like rudders of the most sensitive kind and someone who can deploy these instruments and rudders in such a way that a glide path is created for safe passage. Maneuvering through the unpredictability and costliness of weather-related events is not unlike this exceptional maritime challenge. 
one set of currents is the historically established and foundational carbon-based economy. The other set of currents is the, to be realized, aspirational, future, resilient economy that we need to glide towards in order to avoid the costs that arise from 1.5 degree increases in temperature. Right now, it's as if we are in between these currents, attempting to maneuver away from the destructive and costly forces that our, car that our carbon based economy are creating while heading towards the regenerative and beneficial systems associated with a more durable future state of an economy. This is the treacherous passageway we are navigating, trying to neither stay too long in the carbon-based systems, nor to veer too quickly towards resilient systems that have yet to be scaled to provide for the world's demand. We need skill to do this. We need coordination. We can't just place down the rudders and the navigational instruments and assume that the boat will take care of its own maneuvering. This skill and coordination are what smartly crafted financial, prudential, and market regulation does. Smartly crafted regulation are the rudders that get us through this passageway through this transition. We need them the way we need a rudder to help us transition to a net zero economy in the most stable and least dangerous way possible. The default assumption of many central banks and financial prudential and market regulators is that there will be a relatively smooth transition. The default assumption is one of taking the hands off the rudder, or of using a poor rudder, or a rudder that is not equipped to the job at hand. This default assumption needs examining. It needs examining because the costs associated with inaction suggest that a smooth transition to a clean energy economy will not occur with the default setting. In other words, the current settings of the tools being deployed by the prudential, financial, and market regulators. In addition, if the world is in fact in the midst of one of the most massive and comprehensive economic transformations in history, then sharp market effects are going to become par for the course. Markets don't perfectly match underlying economic realities. In 2021 alone, we have already seen three big market moves in the US that have had nothing to do with the climate transition. The sudden January surge in yields, the February retail investor uprising focused on retailer GameStop, and the March demise of a little known family office called Archegos that inflicted about $10 billion in known losses on banks. In each of these losses, there were sharp market moves. Indeed, market forces are messy, sometimes ahead, sometimes behind. In the context of the climate transition, markets will be adjusting to targets and various policy goals. As they do so, they will have the potential to create significant and unpredictable economic instability, panics, and fire sales with all the costs associated thereto we are likely to see abrupt and sudden shocks as we see markets work their way towards a revaluing of assets, both emission assets and renewable assets. When particular net zero targets are announced, they will need to be met. Meeting them will mean that somewhere along the way, there will by necessity be a devaluation of fossil fuel and other high emission assets. The introduction of specific milestones could help because without them, the timing and magnitude will be unpredictable and uncertain. It will be a crazy ride. Finally, how are the financial regulators supposed to handle this crazy ride? The most prudent course of action 
is to adopt a precautionary imperative. This means preparing the financial system to weather those aspects of climate risk that can't be hedged. Financial firms will need to be the first observers and responders to what they have in their portfolios. When financial firms look under their own hoods to see the vulnerabilities in their own portfolios, they will need guidance as to how to price or value what they find. Without any sort of regulatory or accounting guidance, without any reference to a standardized, credible framework, they will be that ship trying to navigate without a rudder. They will be lost at sea. The financial regulators, together with the financial auditors and the standard setting bodies, need to help the financial firms mitigate climate related threats by stepping forward and incentivizing a rapid, orderly, and just transition away from high emission assets. This they can do in various ways. For example, by considering whether high emission assets will require limits in order to keep them from creating unsafe and unsound conditions to the financial institution that holds them. One can imagine portfolio limits or concentration limits that assist the financial firm in checking their exposure to potential losses and costs. The central banks, in addition to their prudential and supervisory responsibilities, will also need to be prepared to react to the effect of sharp shocks in the oil and gas industry, to potentially large insolvencies of major firms, and to potential demands for bailouts or nationaliz nationalization efforts, especially if the shock occurs at a time when oil and gas needs to keep flowing because it's still needed. Let me close this way. Climate change has put the financial system on a difficult path. Looming climate catastrophe on one side and the economic transformation required to fend it off on the other. Such that grave harm from one or the other is nearly certain, at least in the absence of careful management by financial regulators. This careful management is a task necessary now, not when catastrophe has already occurred. Market forces are now in play that are moving the economy to one less dangerous to our well being, one that is better for us, that produces durable benefits in terms of health, economic well being, and inclusive prosperity. These market forces need a precautionary, and selective amplification from central banks and the financial market and prudential regulatory agencies. Thank you for your time and attention, and I look forward to your questions. Many, many, many thanks, Sarah, for this, um, for this speech that is incredibly inspiring. Um, listening to you, um, I have a question that is, what about stress testing? Is that the right tool for uh, a precautionary uh, imperative that uh, you so eloquently uh, uh, described? Right, so thank you uh, for the question about stress testing. And stress testing is exactly one of the rudders, one of the financial regulatory tools that regulators, in particular central banks, have at their disposal. And the use of a stress test, I think, is an important is an important tool. Now you hear a lot of a lot of discussion saying, "Oh, but the scenarios are too they're too hard. There are too many. We don't know for sure what, in essence, such a such a scenario might look like." And I think that we need to move beyond that. I think we need to to bypass those concerns because there are several known already known scenarios that can be tested, that can be used, that can be hypothesized, and that we can, we can imagine the central banks beginning to use, as they are using already, um, uh, you know, on, on your side of the pond, that essentially will 
hypothesize what, in essence, a significant climate event might look like for a financial firm. The stress tests have the potential, when they're crafted well, to be able to actually um, work very well as important tools. And in your views, um, is that something that we have learned from the financial crisis of 2007 and 2008 that we can use for this very specific uh, crisis ahead of us with all the specificity that you described uh, so well and the fact that we have irreversible impacts on the economy? Uh, what, is that something specific that we can translate from one crisis to, um, to the to the next one, certain sense. Yes, yes. I think I think clearly we learned that the stress tests were tools that could actually be very effective in mitigating the length and duration of a financial crisis. Now, to do that, they need to be credible, right? So we did learn that they needed to be credible. They needed to actually hypothesize adverse conditions that could actually happen and i think the credibility piece is very important here so there needs to be um, a sense that the adverse scenarios that are being hypothesized are in essence scenarios that that could occur and we know in climate there are many that that that, that could occur so i don't think that should be that should be too challenging And should the um, the uh, the regulators use some uh, capital buffer? You, you talked uh, eloquently as well about the fact that corporates uh, could face some severe shocks. Uh, and in order to avoid nation nationalizations, uh, bail-ins, and so on, should we explore um, new capital buffers for corporates or new capital structures? Uh, something that we have for banks like uh, the contingent capital. Is that something that regulators should explore for all the uh, sectors being at risk on climate change? Well, that is a, that is a concept <laughs> that uh, I would say does not have much traction um, on this side of the pond. The idea of capital buffers is a, is a concept that uh, has applied to the financial system and not the entire financial system, I should say, really primarily banks and um, uh, federally deposited insured you know, institutions. So it's not even um, this idea of capital buffers is not one that you see even across the entire financial sector in the US. Your question goes to whether this idea of, of capital buffers should apply corporate wide. Um, and that I think is something that is, I mean, that's, it's a very interesting idea. Um, the, uh, the, the prospects of achieving something like that are probably not on the near term horizon here. And um, lastly, we, we uh... We hear a lot about uh, commitments on uh, net zero uh, around the planet. As you know, um, we have already uh, 113 countries representing $70 trillion. We have more and more asset owners uh, and so on. How do you see the, the US on, on, on that track about these uh, commitments compared to the, to the rest of the world, if I may ask? It's it's terrific to have these commitments. I think that the the fact of the commitments is really a huge step forward, and um, a lot of credit uh, goes to the institutions um, and their stakeholders who are who are driving the need for making those commitments. The commitments, it turns out, are really just the first step here because <laughs> there has to be a way to measure progress against those commitments. There have to be milestones. There have to be some kind of standards by which progress is measured. That piece um, is still not in place. Um, and uh, work, I would, I would urge there to be work uh, done on that. It would help, by the way, with the with the issue that I'm talking about, the issue of this potential for great market instability. Because of course, without those commitments or milestones, what is gonna happen is that there's going to be either early or late recognition of whether a particular firm is meeting those commitments. And those recognitions have the potential to be market moving events. So milestones should be a win-win. 
this should be something that uh, firms are looking for in order to smooth potential viability uh, uh, volatility and, um, and 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 we want milestones in order for these commitments to have some some real meaning because without them I think they are just that mere commitments uh, absolutely um, many thanks Sarah um, we can see um, that the US is um, is back uh, on track on climate change and that you are a driving uh, force in this movement. And so uh, from that side of, of, of the world, many thanks for, for all your efforts and, uh, and the fact that uh, you're, you're so impactful in, in this debate. So many thanks uh, to you and, and to be continued very, very soon. Many thanks. Thank Maybe. you. And thank you for the opportunity.